Cool. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Um, we have kind of a packed agenda. Um, we're going to be obviously chatting with these incredible esteemed panelists we have on today who come from a diverse set of backgrounds from doctors to advocates and activists and even social media content creators who just really care about spreading awareness and making care more accessible to people who are either living with um, eating disorders or in eating disorder recovery. Um, and yeah, are, are really going to share and shed a lot of light on um, just, you know, the state of eating disorder treatment at this time. Um, we've seen a ton of really interesting trends. Some of you may have even seen on the news, um, a lot of, a lot of um, information about how difficult getting care might be at this time. So we're going to be unpacking that and some other great things today. Um, but without further ado, I would just love to pass it over to my panelists here to quickly introduce themselves, um, share who they are, what organization they represent, and what made them interested in getting involved in the eating disorder um, field. So I will pass the torch over to um, Lauren to get us started. Thanks for having me. I'm Lauren Smuller. I'm uh, NIDA's head of programs, and I have the pleasure of overseeing our helpline, um, parts of NIDA Awareness Week coming up, as well as our conferences and really all things programming related to the National Eating Disorders Association. Thanks for having me. Um, oh, and the reason that I got interested in eating disorders was because I had several people who were really close to me who um, had experienced an eating disorder or were currently experiencing an eating disorder. And I really actually had the privilege of getting involved on Nita's helpline um, way back several years ago um, and then have stayed ever since. That's wonderful. We're so glad you're with us, Lauren. Thank you. Um, I will pass it on to Kelly. Hi everyone, so excited to be here. Um, my passion for talking about eating disorders came from having known to talk to about uh, all these things when I was younger. I started struggling with eating disorders at 10, truly had no idea what an eating disorder was even until I was about 20. And I started going to the free counseling center at my college and had to kind of find my own way through Google and resources anywhere I could find to seek a different kind of treatment path and healing. So I'm really excited to kind of talk about some ways to find healing that maybe aren't spoken about enough. I wasn't privileged enough or had anyone to really support me. So I'm excited. Thank you, Kelly. Glad you're here. Uh, Serena, would you like to share about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm so honored to be here with all of you guys. Um, I am Serena Nangia, I use she, her pronouns, and um, I'm the marketing and communications manager for Project Heal. I got involved in the eating disorder community about eight years ago. Um, I got involved in high school when I had my own body image issues. Um, and found out my senior year of high school that my younger sister had an eating disorder. So that really is part of the driving force behind everything that I do. And also um, the work that I do around weight stigma is very much related to like finding community in that space and feeling like I'm not alone. So I'm really excited to represent Project Heal and tell you all more about me and, and what we've been up to. So thanks for inviting us. Thank you, Serena. And thank you for representing Project HEAL today. We're really glad to have you on. Uh, Dr. Griffith, would you like to introduce yourself? Definitely. Thank you for having me. My name is Terry Griffith. <clears throat> I am one of the psychologists at the Center for Eating Disorders at Shepherd Pratt. I kind of fell into the eating disorder world accidentally. I was on my predoctoral fellowship and I was looking for a postdoc. And then I saw that the Center for Eating Disorders had one open for eating disorders. So I was like, let me just try that. So I did it for a year, then did it for two years then loved it. And then this became like my passion. And I'm really, really um, passionate and big on decreasing the stigma just around mental health and wellness, um, representation, providing education. So I'm happy to add value today. Thank you. Wonderful, it is so needed, thank you. Um, and Dr. Guarda, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yes, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. 
I am a psychiatrist and I am the director of the Johns Hopkins Eating Disorders Program um, and have really worked in this field since the, the mid-1990s. And I uh, trained at the Maudsley Hospital where family-based treatment for eating this for anorexia nervosa was developed. And that's really how I became interested in this field. But my um, uh, research interest is in improving, one of them is in improving rates of weight restoration and, and normalization of eating behavior, especially for restrictive eating disorders, uh, so that we can kind of move forward in providing them targeted and, and um, therapeutic treatment to patients who need it. Thank you, Dr. Guarda. Glad to have your perspective on the panel. And Dr. Nicole McGowan, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I work along with Dr. Griffith um, at the Center for Eating Disorders at Shepherd Pratt. I've been here for about 14 years. Um, currently, I'm in the position of the clinical coordinator for PHP, and I also run some groups on the individual um, or in the inpatient unit with uh, for individual and group therapy. And as far as it being my life's work, I sort of fell into it too. I didn't necessarily think I would be doing this. Um, as my life's work, but um, I, it's my niche. And then I also find that um, providing people with the utmost care and um, proper education um, and correct education about eating disorders is what's really important and having the knowledge and understanding of what an eating disorder is and any other co-occurring you know, type of disorders, um, sharing that with them too and educating and then providing correct information like I was saying. Wonderful. Well, I know who I'm going to be asking one of the first questions to then. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. As you all can see, attendees, we're pretty lucky today. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to quickly say, um, you know, this, this first like 40 minutes, we're really going to be diving into a deep conversation with the panelists, um, asking them some questions. Um, but if you have any questions along the way, please use the Q&A feature so that we can like quickly see them um, when we do get to the like 15, 20 minute Q&A portion towards the end. We really do wanna hear your questions and we're happy to answer them as well. Um, so just use the Q&A function. Um, Jamie and Julie, if you see any questions landing into the chat, if you could be so kind as to put them into the Q&A, that would be awesome. All right, well, without further ado, um, let's go ahead and get this conversation started. This first section, we are just gonna be kind of talking about eating disorders like in broad strokes. And then later on, we're gonna be talking about the access to treatment and advocacy and action sort of portions. Um, so to sort of set the stage, obviously, you know, there have been significantly more cases of eating disorders reported since the pandemic. There's been 25% increase in hospitalizations um, and a 40% increase in calls to NIDA. Um, obviously, this is somewhat um, triggered by the lack of certainty around COVID-19, the pandemic, all these changes in schools, all of that stuff, changes to routine, sort of feeling lost, grief. Um, as far as trends go, I'd love to just open up the floor to all of my panelists here. What are you seeing in your spheres? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I, I think that um, certainly at Hopkins, we're seeing a marked increase. And I think this is really true nationwide. In fact, the data suggests it's true internationally. Um, there are reports from Australia, from the UK, from other European countries, and from Japan, uh, as well as from the US, about a marked increase under COVID, especially in adolescents presenting with eating disorders, um, with really a range of different eating disorders. Um, and uh, what we are additionally seeing is an increase in patients who have had chronic eating disorders but been functional um, in an acute exacerbation in their, in their illness that brings them to clinical attention. Uh, so patients have had to often wait long times to get into higher levels of care because most programs now have significant wait lists and they're often sicker. And I think you mentioned, um, Nova, that the pandemic has had an effect. And I think that's for a number of reasons. 
um, and you kind of alluded to some of them, but uh, especially for adolescents, the, adole the pandemic brought a lot of disruption in routine and structure. And that, that included, for instance, homeschooling and teleschooling, and the fact that family meals were less structured, uh, kids were kind of grabbing something to eat whenever. Families were often, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, stocking up on large amounts of food. So individuals who have ha had trouble with binging uh, were, had more access and more difficulty controlling those urges. I think the um, use of social media increased with the, the inability to socialize in real life. And the other thing that being stuck at home did for kids is there was no real peer positive feedback. For instance, there was nobody eating a sandwich at lunch. It was me and whatever I'm watching on Instagram, which was often content that was eating disorder related and uh, probably exacerbated drive to diet, exercise, um, or in some cases, binge. So I wanna give other people a chance to speak, but I think those were all factors. Uh, the stress of the pandemic, social isolation, increased use of social media, and in sometimes um, dysregulated um, meals or, ac or food um, access. Thank you, Dr. Garda. What about you, Dr. Griffith, Dr. McGowan, Serena, anybody? Yeah, I agree with a lot of, with everything that Dr. Gorda mentioned, you know, we are seeing people who are now seeking treatment or during the pandemic deciding to seek treatment, but they're much sicker, right? And I think to add what Dr. Gorda said, the eating disorder is a very secretive illness. So with the pandemic forcing us to be isolative and forcing us to be away from our support, if I'm someone that has an eating disorder, now I have this loud voice that I just easily succumb to. You know, so I think with the isolation, it made it really difficult for people to cope, to use their natural coping skills that they would have used. Um, it's not appropriate for them to like leave and go for a walk or go to someone's house anymore. That could be helpful for them to like block their eating disorder urges and behaviors. So I think the isolation really became really triggering for a lot of people. And then I also think that having a lack of resources, not knowing how to cope, not feeling the same connection with their therapist virtually that they, maybe they would have had in person. Um, and I think all of that kind of compounded made it really difficult for people to, to manage during the pandemic. Totally, thank you. Um, I just and have, so, I just oh, have a little bit to add, not much. Um, it was pretty much covered, but in the sense of, um, even if you did have a virtual therapist to see, but the privacy to meet with them um, was also something that um, I was, told about because I have some um, colleagues who do outpatient therapy and sometimes the kids are in the closet or you know trying to find the best place to have the privacy where parents aren't really listening and you know that type of thing too and everything that Dr. Gorda and Griffith said as well is true. That is so true Dr. McGowan. I mean I'm just thinking about you know my own therapy sessions and kind of having to make sure my <laughs> headphones are on and I'm talking quietly you know because because confidentiality is really important. Kelly, what about you, like, you know, being online and everything, are you noticing more people sort of like drifting towards you and, and stuff like that? I think the utility of social media is quite fascinating because that is exactly where all of our attention diverted to when, when he had nothing else to do, watching other people's lives and consuming other people, maybe living through others. So I think a lot of people in the recovery community that do have socials had a really fun role in terms of doing these tiny little reminders, I would say hey, are you planning on eating breakfast today? Did you eat breakfast today? Just the tiniest little thing that's not an accusatory prompt, but there are a lot of reminders that even myself, when I'm struggling, I forget to talk to myself, look at myself, check in with myself at all. So that's a really nice thing that social media could provide. And I did see a lot of people find the smallest little messages of like, yeah, you should probably eat something. Be very, very, very impactful. And that's really, really cute. <laughs> for sure. Cool. Well, thank you all so much for providing that sort of foundation. Um, I'd love to just sort of step back now and just define a couple of terms for our audience. When we say eating disorders, what are we talking about? Um, this is the one I was looking towards you, Dr. McGowan, if you would <laughs> like, to, like to share, you know, what are some of the common eating disorders? Um, we have anorexia nervosa, um, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder. There's also um, 
ARFID. So I need my colleagues to help me because I always forget what the, um, the words are for, but avoidant, restrictive, feeding. Food intake disorder. All right, there we go. <laughs> All these acronyms. <laughs> yeah, those get me every time. I'm just like ARFID. Um, and then OSFED, other special specified feeding um, eating disorders. So um, basically the way that we gather our information is from the diagnostic statistical manual that the psychiatrists have developed. Um, and it basically helps us to define and identify a disorder. So it's not just us coming out of the blue saying, oh, you have anorexia or you have bulimia. We actually have a guide that we follow. Um, so that those are just some of the, the things that we do in the beginning in the beginning to identify an eating disorder, but there are also some un other underlying causes of having an eating disorder. Um, low self-esteem, uh, co-occurring mental illnesses um, or mental health illnesses such as uh, anxiety, depression, substance use, trauma could be some of those as well. Um, and also with the combination of any social cultural type of concerns or um, psychological or biological factors, um, those also could contribute to having an eating disorder. So it's not just clear cut. Sometimes, you know, it's just an eating disorder. There are other underlying things that are going on. Thank you. And, you know, when you, when you sort of mentioned the DSM-5 and everything like that um, and, and, and gave that background, is there a particular way that someone with an eating disorder looks or like, what are you looking for? Can add to this, and if anyone wants to, oh, sorry, sorry, Dr. McGowan. No, 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 Dr. Griffith, you can take the floor. I was going to say it's more about a particular type and amount of symptoms that the person has. Yeah, so we have the, the DSM that helps us um, put check the box, right? Put a diagnosis in the chart, and it informs treatment and care. But I do think that people should get more open to realizing that you can't look at someone and know if they have an eating disorder. And I think oftentimes the stereotype of what an eating disorder looks like keeps people, you know, prevents people from seeking care. For instance, I think the stereotypical person with an eating disorder is a young, thin female um, that's Caucasian, right? Um, however, in Shepherd Pratt at CED, I can imagine at Johns Hopkins, we get all different shapes and sizes, backgrounds, ages of an eating disorder. And I'm always thinking, how is this eating disturbance impacting their day-to-day -day functioning? And we're treating that. So if I have a patient who is a binger, how is that binging impacting their schooling, their relationships, their work performance, and things like that? And if I have someone who purges, how is that impacting their day-to-day -day functioning? And we're treating the symptoms. So we have the title and the illness for the diagnoses so that we can go insurance and do all those things and it, it can inform care. But I really want to help people get away from this idea of what an eating disorder looks like because you can't look at someone and tell. And I think that's important to note. Absolutely. I'd like to add, and to my own personal experience, I've had three different kinds of eating disorders and I haven't really physically looked much different since I was, you know, 10, 15, 20, I've had anorexia and then transitioned into binge eating disorder, then into bulimia, which is a very common pattern of finding a new coping mechanism game to play with myself every few years. And realistically, there was no one noticing. I'm very small, I'm petite. And I even had sometimes on social media, I would speak on my struggle with binge eating, which was uh, such a life, it, it sh took my whole life from me. And I would get the reception of, you know, well, you don't look like you're really binging or struggling. And so that was very hard for me on this end to just never feel like I had anyone who would listen or care. And for parents who can't see the symptoms or the signals, mine were never behaviors you would see. I'm so good at hiding them. Just watching do they close off a lot? Are, are they seeming in some type of mood? Do they get very tense in certain situations? Kind of just paying attention to them more. It's much more about the emotions and the inner struggles they are hiding. It's, it's the behaviors that I had were barely even the surface of what I was struggling with. So if any parents are struggling to notice any signs, um, I know that's really, really hard. So just paying attention more to creating a safe, open space about feelings there was no open space for talking about emotions and thoughts and other things. So I found ways to cope myself, which was every kind of eating disorder behavior, basically. 
love to hop in here if that's all right, Nova. Um, Project HEAL specifically works to elevate and help folks who are failed by the systems that create these stereotypes. So we provide support through free treatment placements and free insurance navigation. And because uh, insurance is like, what even <laughs> is insurance um, some days? And then also cash assistance grants. Um, Project HEAL has found that, you know, you were talking about COVID earlier, 100% of our applicants for treatment, health, and, and healing um, were affected by COVID, as we all have been. Um, in addition to kind of the way someone looks or like, obviously everyone, all different types of people can have eating disorders, but to show and represent that, 38% of our applicants are LGBTQ plus folks, which obviously you can't tell from the outside. 20% um, are BIPOC folks. Um, and in addition, 29% were not underweight, 3% were men, 59% were older than 24, and 13% had disabilities. So there's a wide array of people who are really searching for eating disorder help and healing. And we are so happy to like be providing this help in the meantime, while we also are working on the systems and changing the system, so. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much for those great statistics, Serena. That was awesome. And Kelly, for your vulnerability, I think, you know, you, you're all hitting the nail right on the head. It can impact anybody, you know, and you can't just tell just by judging somebody by their cover, right? Um, it's something that's an internal struggle. And we, you, you actually just covered some of the common symptoms, which might be that sort of secretiveness. Um, and it's about trying to start that conversation or maybe notice you know, patterns within a loved one um, surrounding food. Um, Dr. Guarda, you've, you've done tons of research, um, clinical research, written papers, um, articles on eating disorders and higher standards of treatment um, to try to improve patient outcomes. Could you share a little bit with us about, you know, some of your findings and, and some key things that maybe other providers could try to implement that might help to improve recovery? That was a big well, question, that's a, sorry. That's a, a lot in the question, so I'll give, give it a shot. Okay, so, um, well, just kind of to give an overview of treatment in the U.S., uh, there's been a big shift in the past 30 years probably in medical care in general, but especially in the eating disorders field, in the sense that when I started in this field, there were um, a few big programs in academic medical centers like Johns Hopkins uh, that provided care for eating disorders. And then with the advent of managed care and the um, pressure to curtail lengths of stay, uh, partial hospitals were created, which are very helpful and a, a very positive development. Um, and after that, um, you know, healthcare has become privatized in a lot of ways in America. There has been a positive and negative aspects to that in the sense that uh, what happened after the development of partial hospitals was the shift out of inpatient settings into residential private programs. And now the majority of higher levels of care provided to individuals with eating disorders take place in the private for-profit sector. And that's a relatively um, black box in the sense that it's hard for patients and families to evaluate. Um, and I'm not saying academic centers are necessarily better, but it's hard to evaluate the quality of care. So one of the things that I've been interested in along with several colleagues is kind of pushing for greater transparency from programs in terms of their short-term outcomes. Most patients admitted to higher levels of care with an eating disorder are, admitted, are patients who are low weight, by no means all, because many are admitted due to comorbid conditions complicating the management of the eating disorder as an outpatient, like severe depression or suicidal thinking or substance use problems or severe anxiety disorders. But the majority probably also are underweight who meet higher level of care criteria according to insurance. That doesn't mean they're the only ones that deserve or need it, but that's who we tend to admit. And one of the issues 
one of the things we know about restrictive eating disorders, like especially anorexia nervosa, is that if we can't help patients get to a normal weight, the starved state perpetuates a lot of the thoughts and feelings that characterize anorexia nervosa. So we have to reverse the star starvation and we have to help patients learn how to eat in a normal pattern and not divide food into safe or risk food based, for instance, on calorie content, but rather eat a wide range of foods in regular meals. So what inpatient programs are doing are they're trying to help patients achieve those two goals and treat their depression or their, their, um, some of the issues that Kelly mentioned, the self-esteem and other uh, underlying problems. But we can't fix the underlying problems if we don't fix the behavior. It's a little bit like addiction. You know, eating disorders are behavioral problems. You act your way into them and you have to kind of act your way out. You can't talk your way out of an eating disorder. So no amount of insight is enough to help you change usually. Like if you're drinking and you have a serious drinking problem, understanding why it started doesn't necessarily help you stop. You have to stop first and then start understanding in therapy. So the higher levels of care are trying to help patients stop the behavior and start the process of understanding. Okay, so I think I'm answering kind of the, the, <laughs> the first part of your question, Nova, and now I don't remember the second part. So um, you were asking me kind of what, I'm, what my interests are. So really to, to try to get better transparency about, for instance, what short-term outcomes from programs, whether uh, what percentage of patients admitted or achieve a normal weight if weight gain is part of the goals, how many patients who have other behavioral problems like uh, problems with purging or binging are able to normalize their eating pattern and how much associated mood and cognitive changes are achieved during inpatient. So we've really been calling for more transparent reporting. One of the problems in response is that it's hard for families to tell how much what they see on a website about outcomes really represent scientifically sound outcomes versus testimonials, for instance. It's easy to find patients who do well in any program but that doesn't mean that the most sick patients tend to do well in a program. So uh, we, we really want, ideally, it would be nice to have a centralized registry that programs reported to and that we were expected to actually provide outcomes data to. For instance, weights at admission and discharge, improvements in mood, improvements in anxiety for all admitted patients, not just the ones that responded to a questionnaire, since that might be a biased sample that was happy with the treatment and therefore will give better uh, responses. So I'll stop there just to Thank kind you. of give others a chance. No, that's great. I think um, what, what I'm sort of hearing in general and just to sort of put it in lay terms, um, you know, just making sure that that conversation is there between all the different providers and sort of gathering all of the data, synthesizing it, and then making sure that you're all kind of learning together in tandem so that you can improve outcomes for all, more people, which is, which is awesome. And I, I just would like to say one other thing in thinking about eating disorders in general, which is kind of how we started, um, it's important to understand that we now, div we now think of the eating disorders as having really three causes. One is your biological vulnerability. We know these are heritable disorders. If someone in your family has an eating disorder, you may be at higher risk genetically, but that's not enough to get an eating disorder. Often there is some kind of precipitating factor, some kind of stress. The COVID pandemic we just described is one, but there are many others. Anything that causes the start of the behaviors and then the problem is that in the long term, if you keep engaging in starving and binging and vomiting behaviors, that there are secondary consequences of the behaviors themselves that make it easier to keep doing it. Again, the parallel with addiction is kind of helpful to understand. So for instance, the, the starved state maintains a lot of the preoccupation with food and weight. 
And it also causes delay in gastric transit. So it makes you constipated full more easily. You wanna eat less or purging. The more patients vomit, the easier it becomes to vomit, even without inducing a gag so that it's hard to stop the behavior. Same thing with binging. Once you're in the behavior, it's hard to interrupt it. So that's why the treatment focuses on behavior first or another reason why it does that. Absolutely. And, and no, this is perfect, Dr. Garda. Um, we're going to talk about access to treatment now. So I would love to turn this over to Dr. Griffith and Dr. McGowan. What are some of the barriers to treatment um, that patients who come to you might be experiencing? Um, you know, we talked a little bit about insurance and how confusing that might be. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Dr. McGowan, do you want me to go first? Yes, I went first last time. <laughs> I think some barriers, I mean, there's so many, right? I think some barriers are not having access, um, <clears throat> insurance difficulties, financial concerns, stigma to me is a huge barrier, especially amongst minority communities. I have a lot of patients who look like me who have parents who don't agree with them being in treatment, right? So even if they leave the inpatient unit, their parents are not on board with them doing the next level of care necessarily. So that's a huge barrier. Um, I think social media in our society can be a, can play a huge role, right? Because the media is telling us, you know, to have a certain body type and look. Um, and in treatment, we want them to normalize their eating and tolerate their distress around the changes they might experience in their bodies. And so when they're seeing these images in the media, that kind of combats what we're teaching in treatment. So that creates a barrier as well. Um, and so I think for a lot, of, a lot of the centers that are offering care, we really provide a lot of psychoeducation. We really try to debunk a lot of myths in treatment and really help people understand the necessity of continuing their care, the necessity of being mindful of what the facts are versus the opinions of others, um, and really try to seek help from professionals who can give them that guidance. So those are some of the barriers that I'm seeing. That's great. Dr. McGowan, did you wanna add anything? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I agree with all that. And then also um, in the sense that once patients do have coverage, it doesn't seem to be enough. So sometimes our patients have um, limited amount of being on the unit, especially if it's inpatient. So they might get a, a week, two weeks. Um, we're just touching the surface or scratching the surface of talking about their eating disorder or any other type of co-occurring concerns that they currently have. Um, I agree about the stigma of having an eating disorder. I also agree about culture and class has something to do with eating disorders. Um, a lot of people don't even know where to go for treatment. Um, maybe don't think that it's a, it's a possibility to go anywhere, that this is just what I have and I have to learn how to deal with it. Um, lacking services, but I also think we have a lot of services in metropolitan type of areas, but maybe not so much in rural areas. Um, so things of that nature that I see from time to time. And then I already spoke on this, but a lack of education and awareness. Um, so I'm really, really proud that we have this panel, but I think it, you know, it just needs to go beyond us too. And I know that we're educating and um, enforcing the awareness on people, but I, I, some people we don't get ever and they never get treatment and families just don't know what to do um, and how to get them in so i think that's a lot of it too um, so the, the more we get to work together and figure out ways to get people in i think is is the best thing to do and to educate as much as possible i'd love to add to that that i think that another piece of it is finding the right care um, and access to care finding the right treatment level of care. We, we find that people often have, with coverage issues, sometimes they are seeking access to care at a higher level that's not covered by insurance or it's not available in the area or whatever the combination of barriers really makes it that much harder to access care. And even with COVID, we're finding now that there are so many people who are trying to access treatment that there are now waiting lists. They have to wait longer to access the level of care that they need and that can exacerbate the problem as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for jumping in, Lauren. I actually wanted to kind of ask you, like, you know, you obviously have call centers at NIDA and everything. Um, what sort of things might you like or accommodations do you sometimes mention to people who maybe say that like their insurance won't cover it? Um, 
Dr. McGowan's, I mean, what you just said about like the, the care sometimes only being two weeks long, but it's like a long process to heal. And we can't just expect to, you know, go through treatment once and be fine. Um, what, what are, what are people doing um, to help with that, Lauren? Yeah, I think as a great first step, contacting uh, the NIDA helpline is a great first tool. You can, it's a great tool for families who are looking for support options for themselves or a loved one. Um, it's also great for individuals who aren't sure where to start or aren't sure what options they have, especially if they weren't able to find anything on their own. Project Heal is another great resource. If you have already gone through all of the channels and you're finding that you know what you need, but your insurance is denying access to you, that's a great tool. We really recommend Project Heal often um, on the helpline for people who are just at a standstill and they don't have any other options left and they really do need additional support. Yeah, I, we so appreciate that, Lauren, and we are so thankful to our, um, I'm going to talk more about our healer circles and our partner uh, treatment centers, but they provide pro bono treatment placements, and we, I, we identify the people most in need and give it to them. So we provided 200 placements last year, which might not seem like a lot, but you know how much treatment costs, so that's... Uh, what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. I'll also add another thing to think about is somewhat um, next steps that you can take while you're waiting for care, potentially accessing support groups. Um, social media can be problematic, but it also offers a great opportunity of community support if it's done in a safe way. Um, there's so many opportunities, I think with COVID, especially with everyone going onto the internet, there are now support groups that are worldwide that people can access to start that conversation and find community with people who are creating safe spaces for them to get started with that process and have conversations in a healing way. Um, we, they can also access, there are now newer online um, early intervention programs that are available. So there are some new opportunities that have come about even the last few years that are more accessible uh, than were previously available for people who are just getting started with that process and, and maybe aren't there yet to access in-person care or um, online formal treatment. Awesome. So many great resources. We're going to have to, you know, compile all of these at the end. Um, Kelly, I, I remember you sharing a little bit um, at the beginning about what you were sort of searching for as somebody who um, whose parents kind of denied helping you get treatment and everything. So you did a ton of digging and detective work all on your own. Um, you, could you share a little bit about what things you found to be particularly helpful? Yes, um, I was a sophomore at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign at the time, and I was suffering so severely with binge eating, I couldn't focus at work or my internship or school. I had developed such severe anxiety, depression that almost turned into an agoraphobia. I never wanted to leave my home. It was my safe space, also like my hell, my chamber, and um, it was just getting so bad that I finally was like, maybe I should talk to someone, but... Um, was never spoken about in my home. And I felt very embarrassed. I felt so ashamed and I felt like I had so, so much was wrong with me. Um, but someone, I can't remember who, but someone mentioned there was a counseling center provided by the University of Illinois that gives you three free sessions. I said, I am taking those free sessions because I have no money, already buried in debt. And I went and I just couldn't believe how accepted I felt. I didn't know that there was anyone who would ever ask me how I feel, what's going on, had resources immediately to tell me. And they said, hey, we actually have a binge eaters support group at the center. I said, that's insane to me. And I wasn't really excited, though, because that's scary to open up and talk to other people. And I think this was the first time in my life that I realized other people did the same things I did with food and hated themselves as much as I did at the time. It just really exploded my planet. I lived my whole life thinking I was just an alien. I feel like that's what struggling with an eating disorder and all these thoughts and behaviors was. I thought I was the only person. So I started going to that um, support group and I was obviously very much told that I needed treatment and I felt really um, embarrassed 
that I couldn't afford it. A lot of other people in the support group were going and would go to the hospital there. And I definitely wasn't going to be able to do that, but I kept on with the counseling sessions. And then I eventually got linked to a therapist also in the area. That was the really cool part about the counseling center. They help link you with a therapist that specializes in what you're struggling with. I could only afford a few sessions and I had to quit because therapy is very expensive. Even with insurance, I didn't have very good coverage. Um, and then I moved back to Chicago after school ended and I started to Google, are there any free support groups anywhere in Chicago? I would take the train to this place called the Awakening Center that's in Chicago and it's a $5 drop in or free if you can't afford it. And there were even homeless people going to a binge eater support group. You know, I really opened up my brain to these people don't even have homes, but they're speaking exactly how I feel about my relationship with my body, my food, and all walks of life, all sizes, all backgrounds, all different socioeconomic statuses. And eventually I got a job, could buy my own insurance and started taking therapy very seriously. And I did therapy for six years almost every single week and mine specifically specialized in eating disorders. So um, the journey was very long and hard. I think a big barrier for me was just building resilience. I was tired and frustrated. I gave up many, many times and I was told that I was very sick, but I couldn't afford to fix it. So I just made do with what I could do and stayed committed, I guess. And so if anyone's struggling to find ways I would say you just make it work if you can. Finding there really are a lot of great free resources for you, as everyone has already mentioned too. For sure. And I I, I just want to, you know, highlight what you just said about that, like feeling less alone in in the struggle with an eating disorder and realizing and meeting other people who get it and like are there too in their own journeys towards healing. I mean, that that's incredible and so important. I mean. That's, that's kind of why NAMI is here with our support groups and everything too, is we believe nobody should have to suffer alone or in silence or feel that stigma so bad that you can't talk to people about what's going on and get help. Um, thank you, Kelly. Serena, um, you shared a little bit with me personally about you know, what inspired you to get involved in the eating, di dis eating discovery, eating disorder recovery sphere. Um, could you share a little bit more about that and also a little bit about weight stigma? Yeah, so this is like the part I'm so excited about talking about weight stigma, fat phobia is like my bread and butter. Um, part of what I shared with you in private was that my younger sister who had an eating disorder didn't have the stereotypical eating disorder like look. Um, she definitely wasn't fat, which fat is a word that I use to describe myself. And so she wasn't in a larger body, but she wasn't in a thin body either. So that definitely was a barrier to her getting care and to my parents who are both medical professionals even noticing that she had an eating disorder. Um, in some ways, in many ways, that is my passion and, and what, propelled me to help out with people with eating disorders, help people like my sister. But I found out about fat phobia and started and went to a workshop and started researching and started learning so much. And there are so many resources by a lot of black women authors, black femmes who have done so much research on, um, on fat phobia and the connection with intersectionality and the need to talk about these issues within the body image space. So being in a larger body is, is a barrier to care. And it doesn't mean that you need to change your body to get care. It means that the care needs to change. Um, and the biggest thing that I think we need to recognize is that weight stigma and fat phobia, um, if you aren't aware of what those are, first of all, they're basically like systemic issues that are more than just reflected in interpersonal relationships and internalized feelings like negative self-talk, fat talk um, is internalized, but these issues of weight stigma are systemic, which means that they are reflected in the laws, um, the education systems and schools and hiring policies and so much more. Um, really excited to share briefly that Striped, which is a 
policy and legislation organization in Massachusetts just is getting some really good feedback on anti-weight discrimination, anti-body size legislation in Massachusetts. So um, definitely check them out. But to underpin all of this systemic issues, which I'm gonna take up my space because I want to like get through this issue quickly, but it's such a complex issue and really important um, is, so teachers report that they have lower expectations for fat students in comparison to thinner students. People in larger bodies are consistently granted fewer promotions and raises than their thinner parts and also make on average one, uh, one and a quarter dollars less per hour than their thinner counterparts with the same qualifications. 90% of emergency rooms are lacking basic equipment like scanners that can accommodate people in larger bodies. And there's a lot of medical bias in, within the medical system that prevents doctors from spending as much time with their larger patients. Um, dietetic students report, 81% of dietetic students report having prejudices against people in larger bodies. So all of this to say is it's a huge, barrier that a lot of people are facing. And um, within the eating disorder community, there's a lot that we can do to start recognizing these issues. Um, Roxanne, it's striped at Harvard. Um, so a lot of the things that we can do are around newer ideas, um, like health at every size and weight neutral lenses. Um, these lenses are really instrumental to addressing the, these barriers to treatment in the community, but unfortunately we see healthcare and insurance systems that um, in place that really complete, prevent completely weight neutral approaches, um, especially within clinical teams, even when wet weight restoration is not necessary. Um, so for example, BMI, which is a widely known, um, not a good indicator of health um, is, has been replaced in a lot of places by ideal body weight, IBW, which is also harmful. Um, and really my hope is that in the future, more clinicians and clinical teams learn about the statistics um, and the impact that weight stigma plays within treatment, that they're more willing to explore new ways of thinking and treating and make more efficacious treatment, lasting recovery plans. Um, and like Project Heal, my ultimate goal is to change the system. But in the meantime, we're trying to, while research and sentiment catch up with what many experience every day, we're, we're going to try to give clinicians some tools and ways that they can create more inclusive practices and treatment programs. Thank you, Serena. Oh my goodness. Thank you for taking us from, you know, your sister's journey all the way to everything that's going on in the medical sphere and identifying the problems, I think is definitely the first step to being able to effectively solve them. So, I mean, if you can share all of these statistics with us later, I think that would be amazing, um, but definitely stuff to keep in mind. So thank you. Um, this brings us right up to our advocacy and action section. Um, so, you know, you've, you've already talked a little bit about Stripe and some other folks who are um, doing the work and, and yeah, I, I'd love to sort of open up the floor um, to Lauren to maybe share some information about like, what are some of the things that people can do, um, some things that we can do in our local communities just to raise awareness and, and fight for these um, changes. Yeah, well, perfect timing. Next week, we start National Eating Disorders Awareness Week. So that is a great and very easy way for um, people to get involved. If you're not sure what to do um, and there's not an event in your area in person or even virtually, then a really easy thing to do is to get involved with our call to action. Um, this year, our theme is see the change, be the change. So we are really evaluating the fact that um, the National Eating Disorders Association has been around now for 20 years. So we're taking that as an opportunity to look back on the last 20 years and all of the progress that has been made in the field, but also be the change. There is so much more, and we've already talked about how much more there is to accomplish um, in the field of eating disorders. And part of that is spreading awareness. And a really easy way to do that is to share your story or share other stories. 
um, get involved in advocacy, raise awareness, talk about eating disorders, recognize that eating disorders are real illnesses that deserve care um, at really any level of the severity. Um, and, and actually as early as possible, we really encourage people to get help when possible. Um, so getting involved with that week and sharing information and resources, if you have had an experience with the eating disorder sharing that story, we will have experiences and stories and conversations um, that we're hosting as well to offer for people to get involved in, uh, is another great way to spread that awareness if you're not really sure where to start. And um, if you or your organization is interested in hosting information, you can sign up to be a collaborator on our website and let others know what you're doing as well. That's excellent, thank you. Um, Serena, and I kind of want to pass this over to the doctors as well on the call. Um, what would it realistically take to make accessible and affordable evidence-based treatment um, with early to diagnosis, not only a priority, but a reality? Um, Serena, if you want to open up the floor and then doctors maybe jump in and, and share what, what those practicalities might be, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll be really quick about it. Um, awareness is a huge and helpful um, issue that we, or way of helping this community, um, which is why we have Eating Disorder Awareness Week. We also have a lot of actionable ways that we can help make systemic change. Like I said, Striped is very open to chatting. Uh, they are very open to chatting with people who are wanting to make similar changes in legislation policies in their own states. Um, we also, there was a comment in the chat that I was definitely going to mention the Eating Disorders uh, co Coalition. They are a national federal um, lobbying organization that helps and does advocacy days one, uh, tw once or twice a year, depending on the year, um, to help get legislatures and policymakers involved in this. So then the actual systems in place can change. Um, so I would say the biggest thing for me is systemic change. As an activist, like this is going to take a long time, but changes insurance practices, doing bias tra training, like recognizing intersectional identities is uh, really important. And um, I'll pass it along to the doctors. Uh, thanks, Serena. Okay, I'll pitch in. Um, I just, again, want to kind of reiterate what our other speakers have said, Serena and Lauren, especially that NIDA has really useful information on how to make your voice heard on their website. So does Project HEAL and the Eating Disorders Coalition. Those three organizations really can help you add to the volume of the voice that, it, that need, is needed in order to actually achieve change. We have to hear it from families and patients. That's who um, politicians hear and listen to. Um, so that's number one. But then I just wanted to say two other things. Uh, one of them we've kind of heard, and that is that there is really a need for resources for the publicly insured, for patients who have medical assistance or Medicare or no coverage insurance-wise, because the reality is that most intensive treatment and often many much outpatient treatment is now only accessible to individuals who are privately insured. And that is a big problem, especially because the most severely ill patients who have suffered significant costs from their eating disorders and maybe are disabled by their psychiatric conditions are likely to have public insurance, to either have disability and Medicare or to have medical assistance. So in some ways we are doing a disservice to the most ill individuals because they have the least access to care. Um, that's uh, kind of just something I really think we need to complain about loudly. Um, and uh, the other, uh, I think, uh, area where we really need help is training in the sense that the treatment of eating disorders is really not that complicated, at least for not so severe cases. So for, the, for, for instance, the typical teenage patient, family-based approaches are not that difficult. The training and, and CBT-based eating disorders treatment is 
um, something that you can learn. However, most training programs for physicians, for um, psychologists, for nutritionists, for those in the, for counselors, provide minimal, if any, training in eating disorders. And that should not be. The general provider of mental health should have training in eating disorders, at least in first line intervention. So we have to push for that on a national scale, because until we have more providers, we're not going to be able to treat everyone. I mean, some of these, one of the good things that came out of COVID has been the sudden leap in telemedicine and, and in virtual treatments. And you know, other, mem other people here, Lauren and, and others have spoken to that. There are a lot of free resources. What Kelly is saying about recovery oriented um, uh, social media is very important. Not all social media is bad. The issue is where you are in your eating disorder. If you're getting worse, there is high likelihood you will access the kind of content that will actually be triggering. If you're focused on recovery, there's a lot of recovery oriented content that can actually be inspiring and um, can help you stay motivated. Because as Kelly said, recovery is a process. It's not a straight line and it takes time. So those are just like some of the things I wanted to make sure that I covered. Uh, so thanks. No, no thank oh, you for bringing it back to the Medicare and Medicaid piece. I, I'm glad you highlighted that. Um, I am keeping an eye on the time here and I wanna be sure that we get over to our participant questions. Um, just as a reminder, we are going till 1.15. We've been slotted to go that long. Um, <laughs> so my last question for the panel before we open it up to the floor, just real quick, everybody, like maybe, maybe a 20 second answer each if you wanted to chime in. What are some steps that we can all take to mindfully create a culture that is accepting of all body shapes and sizes and that fosters a nurturing and safe relationship with food? So um, I'm going to drop a couple of links in the chat because truly it's, so I created this allyship infographic that is how to be an ally to fat people. And I think it has some really great um, steps that people can take in all walks of life to help be allies. Um, and Project Heal, I also dropped the link there. We're doing so much work to help promote and, and help people get treatment. So, thanks. Thanks very much. Go ahead, Lauren. I'd like to also add, we have a body acceptance week that takes place in the fall. And that's a great place if you're really not sure what to do or where to start. Um, to learn a little bit more about it and to hear stories from um, individuals from all different walks of life who um, are working on body acceptance across the spectrum. So that may be a great place to start. Another piece is curating your own universe with people who are interested in body acceptance and fat activism and body activism who are talking about this, normalizing different sized bodies. And especially on social media, it can be really hard to do that if you're not very intentional about your surroundings. And that's a great, really easy place to start uh, with having a community or finding opportunities of conversation to learn more about that. Thank you, Lauren. Does anybody else want to share any tidbits of wisdom um, before we turn it over? Well, I just want to thank Serena for being so candid and open, you know, with your story, your experience. And you said something that's really important. You said, I'm going to take up space because this is really important. You can think of that literally or figuratively. But in general, I think people should be open to that and just having the conversation. Oftentimes as a society, we get so uncomfortable talking about these uncomfortable, tough topics. So taking up space and sharing, conversing, and just addressing our own biases, right? I think as a care provider, you know, if you have your own stereotype or bias, or bias when a patient comes into your office and you have this reaction or these judgments that might not be true. So I think that's really important as care providers and even as people just having the conversation and normalizing doing so. Definitely. Talking, talking is so necessary to just reach some sort of understanding. So I'm really grateful to all of you for talking with us today and to everybody who's here on the call. Let's switch gears now and start diving into some of these questions. Um, so the first question we have is how can parents support young women struggling? It is very difficult to know what to say or do, especially when your child is isolated and suffering. 
anybody want to take that? Go ahead. I would say a great place to start is contacting the NIDA helpline. We have a lot of information and support options for parents, for caregivers who are really just not sure where to start. Sometimes just education is a really good first step, understanding what your child might be dealing with. Um, we have some tips of sort of easy things of what to say and what not to say as well um, that can create a safer environment and more inclusive environment for your child if that um, is something that is hard for you or you're just starting to learn about. There's also support groups and resources for that. FEAST is a great organization for families that has um, their own resources specifically devoted towards families who are um, accessing support for children or um, other family members who are going through treatment. Uh, they have a whole host of options that will give information and support um, really geared towards that perspective. Thank you. I, when you asked that question, Nova, I thought about what would I have wanted my parents to act like because they didn't do any of the things that I really needed. I think one putting your pride aside and thinking about what they would need. And if it has nothing to do with you, Lauren, I really love that you said, well, then just divert to an actual resource that will help. And also something that I realized as I got older and was learning about my family patterns and why I became this way was as a parent, learning to be mindful of the way you speak, speak about yourself, the way you interact with your child, with your partner, within your family system, and with food. I think it is hard for um, the older generations to make those changes because they never had any resources to ever be self-introspective or care for themselves even. We are really privileged to be living in a time where we are told to love ourselves and talk to ourselves and communicate with ourselves, but it's not too late to make those changes because as the child of a parent, all I was ever doing was reacting to what my parent was saying or doing, responding to what they were doing or, or rebe rebelling. Um, so maybe sometimes for parents, it's very difficult to change, but you can maybe even be a little selfish and think, oh, what, what should I change and improve with myself so that my child might be inspired subconsciously? Mm -hmm. That's a really important distinction. No, thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, sorry. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I just wanted to quickly add with parent and children, there is this power differential. So oftentimes children are afraid to tell their parents, I'm really struggling and you might have contributed to this. So I find that oftentimes parents are sometimes defensive or they're like listening to respond and not to truly understand. But I think as a parent recognizing that there's so many resources, you're probably not going to understand, you know, and to think about how they can be supportive versus being defensive or having the child feel like they should be secretive because of the reaction. So managing your own stuff could be really important and your children feeling comfortable opening up about this. Thank you, Dr. Griffith. Um, let's see. So an another question real quick. Do, do any books jump to mind um, that are inclusive children's books about body image that you would recommend to parents? That was a really good question, whoever asked it. If we think of anything, we'll drop them in the chat. Um, the Body Image Workbook by Thomas Cash is a good workbook for parent and children. Cool, awesome. Um, do you mind typing that into the chat, Dr. Griffith? That sounds really awesome. And do, do, do. this participant says, I'm 70 days on my bulimia recovery path. I live with my husband and he's been a great support for me, but enough, even though, I haven't physically binged or purged in 70 days. There have been times where I'm really struggling mentally and have low mood and he has to deal with all these mood swings of mine. He knows it's normal as part of recovery, but at the same time, he gets stressed and frustrated. What recommendations do you have to help me help him or what sort of help he can get? I think it's so important for him to have his own support. Find a support group, find a professional who he can see as well, who can be his outlet and ask questions to. Uh, it's something that, you know, in order to support you, he's gonna need support as well. And that is not something to be ashamed of. We really should um, find community as, you know, it, the eating disorder can affect the whole family. And so it's important for the whole family to use tools to be able to support themselves while they're navigating this process. 
Definitely. And I just want to say congratulations to that individual. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, I also just want to echo what Lauren just said. I mean, that's another thing we, we do a lot of is recognizing the, the family unit and just all individuals impacted by mental health conditions. It's not necessarily always just the individual living with the mental health condition, but those that um, are directly in their support network as well. Um, so yeah. Let's see, this next question is, do eating disorders also impact brain function? My daughter insists she has ongoing brain fog and can't think. How can I help her with that? Uh, yes, um, there's definitely evidence that eating disorders do, especially severe eating disorders do impair uh, neurocognitive function. They impair attention, they can impair memory, concentration, and decision-making skills. So um, it also depends kind of on the eating disorder, but certainly we know that in severe anorexia, when you're very underweight, it is um, all these functions are affected and that they improve with nutritional rehabilitation. But even in bulimia or in binge eating, when someone is normal or, or higher weight, um, the reality is that most patients are eating in a very disorganized pattern. And uh, I mean, I think we've all been hangry before, right? If you skip meals, it is going to affect your mood. And the more you're doing that, the more dysregulated you're going to become in those areas. So that's one of the reasons why you know, we're, we're concentrating on helping patients to normalize their eating and if underweight to reverse starvation. So yes, uh, it is likely that your daughter has trouble kind of thinking clearly, not just because of having a psychiatric condition, the eating disorder, but also because of the physiological neurocognitive consequences of the behaviors. When I was struggling too with my eating disorder or behaviors, I subconsciously and unconsciously was choosing a very dissociative life, very disconnected from myself because with coping and living with an eating disorder, I hated myself so much. I didn't want to notice what I was doing. And that is the big struggle of being able to be present and focus on anything because real life felt very much too intimidating. And I would rather live in the, did I eat? When am I going to eat? What's going to happen next? Did I mess up? It's really those thoughts that, um, controlled my mind. So if your child is struggling with that a lot, sometimes just providing that safe space of how are you feeling and not in an intrusive way really would have been such a nice thing. It For me, a lot of my struggles were very much emotion-based. And I really love what Dr. Guarda is saying too. It really is a balance of the physical, all those things that are happening and, and mental and emotional. So really providing that space for a lot of different conversations to happen, just so that your child isn't stuck in that dissociative state all day, all night, because it's really possible to just live right here all the time. Thank you. No, I think you've both answered that question beautifully. Um, how can local organizations and colleges make sure we're referring clients to appropriate services for eating disorders? I would once again, contact the NIDA helpline. We have a, a, a huge database of treatment options. If you're having a hard time finding things, please don't hesitate to contact the helpline. We have trained volunteers who are there to walk you through that process or your client's process um, and have that conversation with them. What is the level of care they need? What are the options that they need to access? Um, what additional specialties might they need to consider? Those types of questions are all part of that process and part of the conversation on the helpline. And we can really give you the information and treatment options that you need. Thank you, Lauren. Yes, um, does anybody else wanna chime in on that question? All right. Um, Serena, I think you've been answering this particular individual's questions um, about Instagrams and platforms, um, but th th this this person ha is saying that they're um, heading Anita events at their college and are hosting a workshop that's focusing on the importance of being able to cultivate your own social media feed as a form of taking back power from the negative messages we often receive regarding body image versus social media. Um, would you be willing to share any Instagram or TikTok platforms that you would recommend to college age students to follow or for support, education, or encouragement? Other forms of resources are also welcome. So I would say um, for, for the sake of time, if you want to just drop anything into the chat, um, that would be great. 
And would you recommend, okay, so this person's asking if, I, I'd like to toss this one to maybe um, some of the doctors first. Um, would you recommend online therapy resources like BetterHelp or Cerebral for these disorders? Curious about the pros and cons that you see there. Dr. Griffith, Dr. McGowan. I'm honestly not as familiar with the online um, resources you mentioned. I've heard of them, but I don't know how efficient or helpful they are, to be honest. I just think the biggest thing when you're looking for a clinician who can treat your eating disorder, make sure that they specialize in this. I often refer people to psychology today. You can look at their bio, look, look at what they're specialized in. Hopefully it's eating disorders, um, as well as it being evidence-based care and see if it's a good fit. Um, and also, you can also see people who are getting treatment for eating disorders and see if they have referrals. And I find that that's a good option to find someone who's um, competent is the word I was looking for, competent in treating this illness. For sure, for sure. No, um, the psychology today has like a great directory that's pretty easy to navigate and everything. And it just pulls up everybody in your area. I think you can even search by like what insurance they take and stuff too. Great. And what support resources can an employer provide to an employee who might be suffering in silence without crossing the line? That's a really good question. Um, I think that's a very delicate question and it depends also on your, who you work for, your corporation's guidelines. But in general, if you observe behaviors, I, I think that you know, sitting down quietly and just expressing concern and listing what you observe, not interpreting it, but just saying what your concern is, um, that I never see you eat or that, you know, um, they're spending all of their break running around <laughs> the, the grounds um, and just giving them space to, to talk about it. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, there isn't really a right answer and it depends on the situation. It's very case specific, so it's hard to generalize. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right that it's a very delicate conversation, but I do think like, you know, just bringing more mental health awareness to workplaces and, and initiatives to just sort of make sure that employees know that it's okay to talk about their mental health, um, sharing statistics, sharing information, sharing knowledge, um, yeah, NAMI actually, we, we, do, um, we do mental health in the workplace presentations. So I mean, even something broad in general like that, maybe it's not like accusing that individual, hey, I think you might have this or this or that, um, but it's just saying, you know, it's okay to talk about mental health to the whole group and set up that culture um, of just having conversations can really help. I just uh, dropped a link in the chat also. This is really designed for caregivers and I um, echo Dr. Gorda about just recognizing that there are certainly boundaries with workplace and what is an appropriate conversation to be having. Um, if you're having a friendly relationship and that is the appropriate place to have that conversation, um, the link I just dropped is a, is a great framework for things to use and how to frame your conversation in a really delicate, sensitive, non-judgmental way. Um, but I would agree about cautioning where the boundaries are with your work relationship and what, recognizing whether or not that's the right space to have that conversation. Right, right. I also wanted to echo Nova that um, we have clinicians, our CEO and our program director are clinicians and they do presentations for workplaces. So um, you can always reach out to me and I can get you connected to that. I think there's like a way to have those conversations and to provide a space, whether to self-reflect or to like start having these conversations within your close network um, that can be really helpful. And to Serena's point, I think there is a, there's a place in your work environment to create a safe space for um, eating disorders or people who might be experiencing eating disorders or body image issues and creating a safe environment for that to um, take place and changing kind of workplace culture, if you will. Um, I imagine Project Heal does similar types of presentations to Nita in terms of having those conversations. So there might be a way to be proactive about supporting a coworker, um, even if having that conversation in that particular way is not the right approach in your work environment. I love that. that that's awesome. 
Um, well, thank you all so much. I mean, you've shared so much information today. I'm really, really grateful for all of your time. Um, everybody who's joined this conversation, I am grateful for your time as well and for listening and just, you know, being so candid with your questions and your journeys as well. Um, everybody here, thank you so much for, for just all of the work you do. It's so important and so needed. Um, and we are right at time. So I'm going to say so long to everybody. Thank you for being here. We will follow up in an email with some of those um, resources that were mentioned today. And yeah, I hope everybody has a great rest of their week and take care. So Bye. long. Bye-bye. <laughs>